The MGC originally had a very poor press because of various uh, mistakes that were made reportedly on the front tyre pressures etc and the press slated the car. It's not anywhere near as bad as the original press that it got and is a much loved niche market car now, has a fantastic sound and makes a fantastic Grand Tourer. Availability for parts is very good because the majority is MGB. There are some structural components that have to be specially made, which can make things expensive. Cost-wise for a restoration, you could quite happily spend 40 plus thousand pounds. Visually, the MGC is very similar to the MGB, except the MGC has 15 inch wheels and it has an alloy bonnet with effectively two power bulges in it. So what should you be looking for and at when buying an MGC? What key areas should you be inspecting? And what key issues should you be aware of? First thing I would suggest would be to look at our buyer's guide for the MGB because everything on the MGC from the middle of the car backwards is the same as an MGB. The rear axle is slightly different, but on the whole, all the things that we've talked about on the MGB buyer's guide apply to the MGC. The MGC is different to an MGB from the middle of the car forwards. You've got different floor pans, different chassis legs, cross members, and suspension setup. The MGC uses a torsion bar setup suspension, which is very good, it's height adjustable, but there are some components that are becoming hard to get. The MGC front suspension can be modified, and there are companies that sell items that will allow you to keep the car on the road if you can't get the original parts. When sitting in an MGC, see how the steering wheel sits against your legs. If it's really tight up, the seats may be MGB seats, which have a higher frame. The MGC, because the floor is higher, has a lower frame. You also need to check if it's an original steering wheel, which is leather bound, thin leather bound. If it's a replacement wheel, ask the vendor if there is the original wheel with it they're a rare piece of equipment. When looking at an MGC, you've got to look very similar to MGB areas, such as the sills, the floors, the suspension pickup points. Corrosion is your enemy, or it always will be. Look at the condition of the paintwork, see how the car sits on the ground, and make a decision based on what you see and what you find. Different on the MGC to the MGB, you need to make sure you look at the torsion bar mountings, the cross member, the engine and the front suspension. People buy a GT V8 because they love the sound of a V8. It's classic lines, it's the factory original V8 and it's an all year round usable vehicle. There was a very low production run of the GT V8 and they are nowadays very sought after to the point that you have to be careful when buying that you're actually buying a true GT V8 and not an MGB GT that has been converted to a V8. So that's one of your starting points to check the chassis number. Should start GD1, not GHD5. As the car is based on an MGB stroke GT, all the buying advice is very similar to an MGB or a standard GT. Corrosion, sills, floors, suspension pickup points, these are all very, very important in making sure there's no corrosion, they're all in good order. If it looks like a patchwork quilt underneath, walk away. In original form, the GT V8 had cast manifolds, cast exhaust manifolds. Over time, they crack. Not an unusual situation, You'll often find that they've been repaired, but that still doesn't last. The best route you can go, if that's the case, is to put 
tubular manifolds on and you'll find most cars will have that now. It's quite rare to find one with original cast manifolds. The GT V8 gearbox can be a little bit of a weak point. You can lose synchromesh on second and if it's an early box which had overdrive on third as well, you can have problems with third. So make sure operation of it works well. It's going to cost you about two and a half thousand pounds to have one of those gearbox rebuilt. A lot of people choose to go five-speed conversion, which they use in the RV8, and you can have either an LT77 five-speed, which is an older five-speed box, or an R380, which is a more modern box, sort of Land Rover defined, but uh, was used in the RV8. GTV8 wheels are unique to the car. They're a composite. They're chromed outers. If the chrome is damaged and beyond repair, you can't now split the wheels. There's no one that reconditions them. So you've got a bit of a problem. Making sure they're really good is a must. If you are looking at a GT V8 or even a V8 Roadster that has been converted, by that I mean a standard MGB with a V8 engine installed into it, make sure that everything works as it should in terms of gearbox when you're pulling away in first, second. If you feel first is very high, then the rear axle ratio could be wrong. If they've used the standard MGB rear axle without changing the ratio, first gear effectively doesn't exist because the ratios just don't work, so you'll be using second to pull away in. The RV8 was introduced in 1992 by MG Rover, reintroducing the MG name back into main manufacture. This was a precursor to the launch of the MGF. People buy an RV8 because they love the sound of a V8. The looks of the car is very masculine. It's a modern MGB. Some owners feel the RV8 is the pinnacle of MGB ownership. Early MGB owners may disagree with that, any MGB owner may disagree with that, but they certainly hold a niche place in the market for MGBs. The RV8 was based on an MGB Roadster, much more muscular, like an MGB on steroids. Different front and rear bumpers, unique rear lights, Porsche 911 headlights. It's got a 3.9 V8 engine, which is fuel injected. The RV8 has a unique rear axle, therefore you have to be careful that it is oil tight and not noisy because finding another one is going to be a very difficult job. Having said that, the mechanics on the car are pretty bulletproof. The windscreen frame is important. It's a steel frame rather than an alloy frame and it corrodes from the inside out. Any sign of corrosion is expensive to fix. You have to take the screen out, have it welded and corrosion replaced with good metal and then refitted. It's expensive to do. The Japanese spec of RV8 has air conditioning. You can tell that from the outside of the car because you've got the indicators followed by air intakes. On the UK car, you have fog lights instead of the air intakes. On the dash, you've got a couple of outlets for the, the cooler air. Spare parts for the RV8 can be a little tricky to get. The front headlamp cowlings are difficult. The rear lights are difficult. They're unique to the car. Therefore, look for any damage even cracked lenses can cost you a lot of money. The RV8 wheels are a composite wheel. They're no longer available, so you've got either a high cost to have them rebuilt, or you can buy aftermarket wheels, but they're not the original size. They're a 17-inch replacement, which just changes the look of the car slightly. Some people prefer that in the modern age of big wheels, but if you want it to be original, it's the original 15-inch, so see how they are. Also, when you're talking wheels, you're talking tyres. We've seen lots of RV8s on the original tyres, which are well past their sell-by date. A tyre shouldn't be any older than 10 years old. If you've got 20-year-old rubber on the car, budget for replacement tyres. Trim-wise, look at the interior because it's quite a light colour. Check that the leather's good, it's clean, there's no rips. On the walnut side of the dash, check for cracks. And on the door cappings, again in walnut, they are very susceptible to water ingress, which cracks the walnut. All can be replaced, but at a cost. Hopefully these helpful tips will see you well on the way to enjoying your new MG. 
For more free pre-purchase advice, then simply contact the MG Owners Club technical team via the website or the technical hotline.